a brand new solution for a century old machine. Our first too big for the studio metal additive part on this episode of the Cool Parts Show. The Cool Parts Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. When it comes to managing metal powder, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Stick around after the episode to learn more. I'm Pete. I'm Stephanie. Welcome to The Cool Parts Show. This is our show all about cool, unique, interesting 3D printed parts, and today we're on the road to show you a cool part that was so heavy we couldn't get into our studio. Right, this is our first too big to travel 3D metal printed part. 3D printed in carbon steel, and this is a digitally manufactured replacement part for a piece of machinery that's going on 100 years old. That's right, so we're gonna talk about legacy replacement parts here, we're gonna talk about digital inventory, all kinds of interesting things. But first, let's just talk about the setting. So we are here at Lincoln Electric Additive Solutions. Um, Lincoln Electric, the parent company, is very well known for providing welding equipment, welding materials. And Lincoln Electric Additive Solutions is applying welding in a new way, using it as a means of 3D printing. Wire arc additive manufacturing. Think robots printing with welding wire. And in this case, that was very helpful to a different part of Lincoln Electric, um, a, a manufacturing process related to welding. Uh, a substance used in welding is flux, a, a granulate particulate material. This is a replacement component for a machine used to make flux. Uh, here is the 3D printed version, here's the finished machine version, but this is a flux mixer bearing housing. Right, so flux. If you know welding, you probably already know this, but if not, flux is this material that's used as a coating on stick electrodes. Um, as you're welding, the material protects the weld, it, helps the, it can help it fuse and, and flow, and provide other benefits as well. So Lincoln Electric has seven of these giant machines that are used to mix flux. Um, at any given time, six of them are being used in production, and the seventh is being pulled out and, and repaired going through preventive maintenance. So old, old machines, uh, re-engineered, rebuilt all the time. And in the course of one of these rebuilds, they discovered that this, this vital component, the housing for a big bearing, was starting to crack and needed to be replaced. Right, so let's bring in one of our experts. This is Brandon Juszczyk. He's the manager of the engineering facility team here at Lincoln Electric. During one of our repairs, we disassembled a mixer and noticed that one of the bearing housings had developed a crack. The bearing housing is one of these large steel castings uh, that's original to the OEM design. And although at the moment it wasn't a catastrophic failure, we know that uh, a crack of this type is going to require a replacement. A repair on a component like this can be really difficult. We likely would have tried to contact the OEM and source a replacement. However, uh, due to its age, it's likely that we would be making our own mold or paying the OEM to develop that mold again to recast an 80 plus year old part. A challenge that's probably not normally thought of is once you, you invest in these molds is then storing these molds, especially for components that you know, you're not going to use all that often. We had a, a mold that it had been stored for 10 plus years before I had to make another part. And at the time um, to go use the mold, I then had to invest more money into repairing and refurbishing the mold just so I could use it again. So Brandon talked about how the challenge with getting this part remade is the need for a mold. Are we aware of any part making processes that don't need mold tooling? I'm glad you asked. It turns out wire arc additive manufacturing is a great solution to getting large metal parts pretty quickly. So Brandon and his team were pretty lucky that when they discovered this problem, they have this whole other division within Lincoln Electric that's really good at applying um, wire arc additive manufacturing to get large parts like this. Can we learn more about wire arc additive manufacturing? Sure. Wire arc additive manufacturing, or as we call it sometimes, WAM, is a type of metal 3D printing. Technically, it's a type of directed energy deposition. Um, and it's similar to traditional welding, like you're using an arc as the, the mechanism to, to melt and fuse the material. Um, but with traditional welding, you're usually thinking about like joining two or more parts together. And with WAM, it's more the case that you're building something up from scratch. So here at Lincoln Electric, um, the WAM systems that they use are fed by welding wire. It's the same welding material that you could use in other situations. Um, and the deposition heads are mounted on robotic arms. So that's how they get the motion into the system. Sometimes they also pair those robots with turntables or other motion devices to get even more flexibility. So, so, so two things about that. So first of all, um, 
3D printing in metal with a robot. So you think of 3D printing and you usually think of that happening inside a 3D printer. The robot makes this a great solution for really big parts because if you're if you're using a 3D printer it's a it's a box and you need a machine bigger than the part that you're making. But in this case here's a way to get a big part without needing a big machine around it. Uh, essentially within any area of space and volume that that robot can reach you can you can build a part. And then an, another aspect of this is that that robot has a lot of freedom of motion, a lot of ability to pivot, apply this material from different angles, different directions, combining that with uh, the freedom to uh, pivot and rotate the part, maybe with a pivoting turntable that the part is mounted on. All of that means that these layers of deposition don't have to be parallel to one another. They can happen at different angles. That provides a lot of freedom for creating features of the component without support structures that have to be removed later. And that freedom proved instrumental in making this particular component. So now let's bring in Brad Barnhart, an engineer with Lincoln Electric Additive Solutions. In the eyes of traditional AM, it was uh, definitely unusual and a little bit less so for WAM, but we did need to print this component in multiple directions due to the uh, part having significant portions, of geometry having overhang, right? So, and what I mean by different directions is we repositioned the printed part using one of our robotic manipulators such that whenever we are welding on it, we don't have to fight gravity the entire way. We always wanna be welding down, not you know, from the side or underneath those things are a little bit more complicated to do and to do accurately. So we can move the part as needed just to make the welding much easier. We do this, right, mainly because we want to avoid creating support structures. We don't want to print extra material when we don't need it, um, mainly because you need to do, machine it off or it might further increase weight. And unlike powder bed side where a lot of support structures are relatively thin in nature. Um, this is fully dense. So if you're printing you know, an inch thick support structure, it's an inch to take off and material that's fully dense. So, so as Brad just described, like WAM and, and the way that it plays out at Lincoln Electric allows you to avoid those support structures. And that's a really big deal. Like we've seen that be a real challenge in other types of 3D printing. So if you think about laser powder bed fusion, you might be designing some kind of crazy support under your part just to make sure it prints right. And that means you also have to figure out how to remove that crazy support structure later. And so for a part like this being made from WAM, you're saving the time of removing supports on, on the back end, as well as getting away from the lead time of needing casting tooling, as Brandon was describing earlier. Um, but let's talk about the design of these parts, because Lincoln Electric had an opportunity to not just create what already existed, but to sort of really think about what this component needed to do and make some alterations to the design. Like, let's focus in on that last part because uh, this is an 80, 90 year old machine and, and there is a lot of, of industrial work being done on machines that are like that, machines that have been in service for decades. Uh, they need replacement parts and um, it goes without saying there's no, there's no CAD model in existence, but, but likely there's no print either, there's no drawing. So, how did they get the dimensions? How did they get the geometry for this part? So in this case, it all started with a 3D scan. So that's how they got a, a model of the part to begin with. But that doesn't mean that that was the design that they stuck with. When we 3D scan all of our parts, we are using a creoform uh, piece of equipment. Um, we have the uh, MetroScan. So it's a contactless uh, structured light scanner. Um, so we're able to reconstruct the surface of the thing that we are scanning. Um, and that's been real convenient because when you start going to large parts that may be still in the environment which they're operating, they may be out of it, but it's a, a portable solution where we can go get a quick 3D scan. And when I say quick, these parts that are you know, on the order of feet can be scanned in a matter of minutes. Uh, we take that 3D scan, this surface model, and we use that as a basis for recreating a solid CAD model to print off. So one of the other advantages is once we started scanning the part and got it into the CAD environment is uh, we get our engineering hands on it and we start making improvements. So the original casted design had a, uh, a blind pocket, which uh, required some difficult measuring, machining to set the proper preload on that bearing. Well, now we have the opportunity here. We were able to, to modify that design in a way that would give us access to this blind pocket 
and we really think it's going to improve our ability to, uh, to set the proper preload on the bearings, which will ultimately extend the life of the machine. So something I want to say here is that while this was a, a case where the part was cracking, it wasn't like a catastrophic failure. It wasn't an emergency situation. So Lincoln did have time to sort of sit back and, and think about what this part does, what they'd like it to do, make those design improvements. Um, all that being said, they still achieved the, the production of this part on a timeline that's much faster than they could have gotten tooling made and got a casting um, and, and gone through the conventional route. This is a 500 pound part. They 3D printed it in about four days. The freedom to pivot it in different directions meant there were no support structures needed. So they, they avoided that challenge that's common in 3D printing. It needed some machining. We can see the, the machine surfaces here. A nearby machine shop was able to do that pretty quickly. So all told, the, the lead time, the turnaround for this was very fast. This was in a very efficient efficient way to produce and obtain this part. It was such an efficient way to, to get these parts that uh, for other mixers, Lincoln Electric is not waiting for the bearing housing to fail. That's right. Brandon told us that they want to test the 3D printed bearing housing for a little while, but assuming everything goes well, that this is just going to be a, a regular part of the maintenance on the other mixers. I think we got this. Do you think we got this? I think so. All right, I'll start. This is a flux mixer bearing housing. This housing, the original, was starting to crack. They discovered it was eventually going to fail. It needed to be replaced. Uh, the replacement was made not through casting like the original, but made through wire arc additive manufacturing. The facility engineering team was able to take a 3D scan of the existing part. They used that as the basis to do some design improvements, make some tweaks, um, and then they were ready to 3D print it. So these parts are 3D printed from carbon steel using wire arc additive manufacturing. They weigh about 500 pounds and it takes about four days to print one. After they're printed, they need some finished machining before they can go into use. Um, and because of the results of this project, Lincoln Electric anticipates that they're going to be able to swap out this component on all of their flux mixers um, and proactively make this upgrade to their, to their systems. So this is an example of how 3D printing can be used as a replacement for casting. It's an example of how it can be used for legacy components. It's also a digital inventory example. Because Lincoln Electric has gone through this process of creating a digital design for these parts, the next time they need one, they can just print another. They don't have to worry about keeping these in inventory or storing casting tooling or any of that. Thank you, Lincoln Electric. Awesome, cool part. Our first too big to travel metal additive component. Thank you, Lincoln Electric Additive Solutions for hosting us at your facility. If you like this episode, leave us a like, leave us a comment, and make sure to subscribe to our channel so you get notified about all of our new episodes. And if you have a cool part you'd like to see featured, even if it's too big to travel, let us know. Cool parts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thanks for watching. This episode is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. We're past the point of not knowing how to qualify metal 3D printed parts. We know it's just that different end users of those parts have different qualification requirements. Additive manufacturing service providers have to navigate that, and Carpenter Additive has to think about that in tailoring powder management solutions. Our customers typically will have, if they are a service provider, they will have a series of end user customers who may be, say, OEMs in the aerospace world. And each of them has a, has a fairly large team of engineers who've been doing this for decades or more and have developed all these standards, regulations, paperwork. So it is, a, it is certainly a challenge to uh, find thread the needle between all of these different requirements. We start really high level, we walk on the shop floor, we ask them about, okay, source to sink, how do you bring in the materials, goods in, uh, you know, send that material to each of the, the systems and then what we're really interested in is how do they reuse that material. So what we do is call the value stream map. Pretty often that leads to a series of things that were not either overlooked or hadn't really boiled up to the surface yet in terms of things that are potential risks or potential challenges or inefficiencies that exist. A lot of the customers we work with, especially in the more regulated industries such as space or medical or aerospace, have already been through those early learning stages. They've put five plus years into this. They've done the product design and the, the design for man additive manufacturing. And now they're starting to reach some of the more finicky problems that you get when you're at the scale of maybe five, 10 machines 
you're running different materials simultaneously, you're doing different programs. Right, we get to take the best from the medical field and the aerospace field. We understand the specifications and the, uh, the standards that exist in each of those fields and we can sort of take the, the best elements of those and, and customize that to our customers.